welcome everybody. Uh, it's my great honor to sort of host, chair, whatever you call it, uh, the History of Ideas uh, seminar, seminar series. I mean, we have two amazing speakers today, speakers that I really look up to, right? And uh, <laughs> I see one of them <laughs> shying out on their sort of humility, but uh, nothing to be reticent about. Our first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Shudhita Sharkar. Right, who's, uh, who's a member of the faculty here, he's an associate professor here. And he does work on the big problems, right? On, the, on, on, on gravitation, black holes, and other important, important things. So he's gonna tell us about relativity. And uh, you can find a lot about him on the web, of course. And there are certain things that he cannot. Right? For instance, the fact that he's a very good cook, right? <laughs> and the fact, and the fact that uh, he's an, uh, he's one of our shining lights in terms of doing all the science outreach that that we are doing. He's a, he's an inspiration there. So over to you, Shudit. Okay, thanks, Anirvan. So let me start. And uh, the first task uh, would be that look at all the pictures in this slide, and if you could identify all of them, then probably you don't need to attend this talk. I mean, probably you know everything about relativity. What I'm going to talk about. But nevertheless, let me start. So uh, first of all, let me give you the disclaimer and uh, this is to set the expectations correct. So what is this talk is not, okay? So this is not going to be a seminar on the theory of special relativity. So if you are interested in theory of special relativity, to be honest, you have to read textbook. Second of all, it is not going to be a seminar on Einstein's life. In fact, there will be hardly two to three slides on Einstein, okay? I mean, this is a special relativity, not a special relativity seminar. And most importantly, this is definitely not a talk on time travel, black holes, curved space times on all those exotic things, okay? I mean, you're not going to get such thing in this talk, okay? So the idea of this talk is very simple. It is an attempt to follow the historical development and the ideas, rather great ideas that led to the theory of relativity. I'm trying to, uh, summarize, of course, it's very almost impossible because the amount of literature on this subject is so enormous. Okay? It's very difficult to read and ponder and understand. But nevertheless, I'll try at least to briefly give you the gist that what was the historical development and main ideas before Einstein. Okay, So that's the expectation from this talk you should have. So let's go ahead. So it's all started with this paper, okay? So of course I cannot read German. So one side is the original German paper, which I copied from the net. And the other side is the famous paper translated into English. And the title of the paper is called On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, 1905, Albert Einstein. 1905 is a very famous and very, very important uh, year for physics, for all science rather where Einstein published five remarkable paper, which has all of them has um, milestone papers in our history of science. So if you try to read this paper, interestingly, you will see the first line, it says that Einstein, uh, it is known that Maxwell's electrodynamics as usually understood at the present times when applied to moving bodies leads to asymmetries, which do not appear to be inherent in the phenomena. Now, this is a remarkable line. I mean, I was been trying to understand the meaning, what he actually meant by this line. And in fact, there's enormous literature just to understand the introduction of this paper. Whatever it is, what is clear is that Einstein was thinking very, very intuitively on Maxwell's electrodynamics, rather on the phenomenon of electrodynamics, okay? The idea of this talk will be to follow Einstein's compass. If all of you probably heard this famous story of Einstein's compass, which always pointed out towards the north, one of the side of the compass. And this intrigued Einstein that there is a beautiful law of nature which forced a compass always in a one particular direction. This is somehow led to scientific curiosity within his mind when he was childhood. So therefore, if we really want to know what was Einstein's motivations for general relativity, how the historic ideas have came to relativity, right? then we should start with the history of electrodynamics, okay? So that give me justification to look at relativity. Now, one also, it is important to uh, understand that the history of special relativity is a logical conclusion of a remarkable journey, attempt to understand one of the fundamental aspects of natural sciences, 
the nature of motion. Okay, this is as fundamental as possible. It's from the beginning days of humanity. Humanity asking, what is the nature of the motion? How do things move? What is force? What is acceleration? Okay, so relativity answers these questions remarkably well and very simple way. Okay. Also, the story of theory of relativity is also a story of several great personalities and their struggle, their egos, and to know the unknown. In fact, if you read the literature of history of science, which I've been started reading very recently, you will see that the theory of relativity is almost has a, have a canonical status. Like all the modern ideas of scientific revolution use the emergence of relativity as a test case. Okay? So this is like a simple harmonic oscillator for you know, history of science. Interestingly, there are important quotations. So this talk, I will extensively use quotation. Unlike physics talks I give, I hardly use quotation. Nobody, but it, it turns out that it is important to give quotation in this kind of talk to you know, uh, tell you the ideas of actually what people wanted to say. So if you read Thomas Kuhn, The Nature of Scientific Revolution, where he uh, described what is the nature of science, how the challenge changes through paradigm shift, so he makes this very, very interesting distinguish, with distinguishing between the Newtonian concept and the Einsteinian concept. Even Thomas Kuhn says that, what do you mean by space, time, matter, force, etc.? These words completely changed their meaning after 1905. What do you meant by mass before 1905? And what do you meant by mass after 1905? Same English word. Their meanings that, I mean, there is a completely epistemology, I mean, it's very, uh, philosophical change of the meaning of those words. So Einstein's revolutions is in that sense is that deep, that remarkable. Okay. So let's try to start uh, to understand the historical processes which led to this revolution. So before going to this processor again, we should start that okay, we have talking about we are talking about special relativity, but how much we trust special relativity? Well, we test every day relativity. So whenever you are using your GPS technology, when somebody is sending proton, photon, proton beams in sun super collider, and whenever somebody is measuring gravitational wave in LIGO observatories, there are, you are testing special relativity. There are many, many lab tests in atomic physics, interferometry, quantum optics experiment. All these tests, even today, I mean, even few, one or two years ago, the recent test, remarkably confirm the accuracy of special relativity. In fact, one of the most remarkable tests of special relativity is comes from measuring what is called the gamma ray burst. These are like huge cosmic explosions, okay? I mean, millions and millions of times more powerful than anything you can imagine, okay? And they're happening at the end of the universe, very large distances from us. And the light is coming from those distances to us. They're like at the end of the other side of the universe. So what astronomers did is that they what they simply did, they got this light and measured the speed variation with respect to the wavelength. So they're asking whether the speed of a light is same for all wavelength. And the prediction of relativity is that it should be independent of the wavelength or the frequency of light you are measuring. Now, what it turns out that the gamma ray burst enforces us to believe relativity even up to what we call the Planck scale. So this is believed that the Planck scale is the highest energy, which is to be, you know, uh, we can, the current laws of physics are valid only very close to the Planck scale. At the Planck scale, our understanding of space time is completely will be revolutionized. So although we don't know what it would be, but now it is clear, even very close to the Planck scale, uh, there is absolutely no violation of the constancy of speed of light. And uh, this is what makes us believe that relativity will, pro special relativity as we know today, the Lorentz invariance. I'll explain these terms, probably is the law of nature, I mean, in a very, very deep energy state of the physics, okay? So we trust the data completely in conformity with the Einstein's prediction, at least in special relativity. So where should we start the history of special relativity? So of course, if I told you that we should start relativity with the electrodynamics, then you should ask where should we start with the history of electrodynamics? So I was looking at various mentions, uh, references of mention of electromagnetic phenomena in ancient history. The earliest I could able to find, of course, this is my inability. There could be something, I mean, I don't know. I am only a novice here. 
So it is mentioned that there is a fourth BC Chinese text. It's called the Book of the Devil Valley Master. And there's a mention that people used to carry out a stone, it's called a lobe stone, which is South Pointer. Look at the cultural difference. They are not talking about North Pointer, they're pointing about South Pointer. Okay, I don't know why, okay? So there's a very nice book, which I found. It's called Robert Temple, The Genius of China. I just started looking at it. And there is a very interesting mention of this uh, South Pointing stones in this book, the, the original Chinese text, okay? So this is probably the first mention of anything of magnetics, natural magnetism in any ancient text. Okay? In fact, but if you look at many, many antiquity texts during the Greeks and Romans, there is also a mention of phenomena like lightning strikes, St. Elmo's fire. You should figure it out what is a St. Elmo's fire in Wikipedia. It's a very interesting literature on this. And these are documented in many, many ancient and as well as medieval literature in all cultures in the world, okay? including Indian cultures. Okay? There are writing write-ups in uh, ancient Greece, okay? And you will see that they are talking about that if you take amber and if you uh, rub it, and then you will see that the amber can attract light objects. So okay? this is like the static electricity, as I mentioned. In fact, this is interesting to know that the current word of electric, English word, like electric and electricity, actually came from the Latin word for amber, which is electrum or the Greek word for amber, which is electron, okay? So th these are actually related. Amber is basically resin, okay? So it's very interesting to know that even uh, the words are related to such ancient ideas which people have first observed, okay? But these were like only observations. There was not much of a detailed physics understanding there, hardly anything. As far as we know, the first scientific understanding or scientific quest towards magnetism started with a guy which was a physician. This is the picture of this guy, a physician at the Queen Elizabeth's court. His name is William Gilbert. And I was reading about Gilbert. He was a remarkable person, okay? In fact, he was also a natural philosopher, a physicist, a physician, okay? And in any, in, it's quite an interesting personality. So he is the person who digested and opposed both Aristotle as well as the, at that time, the Pradhavan University elite culture, okay? Well, um, he has this famous book called De Magnete, okay, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And this, that, in that book, he wrote down several interesting experiments related to the magnetism. He is the, also the person who first suggested that Earth has magnetic poles, okay? I don't know whether he understood the magnetic poles are different from the, geometric, uh, the uh, geographical poles, that I am not very sure, but he definitely mentioned about magnetic poles. Okay? Interestingly, the first, there is one person who actually mentioned that there is a relationship between electricity and magnetism. This is also a German mathematician who is residing in Russia. Uh, Russia. His name is Franz Apinos, and he's a very interesting person. So his idea was very simple. If you look at some of his old write-up, which is still there in the internet. So he was saying that there is an attractive force in amber and there is an attractive force between magnet and iron. Can they form or, or from same origin? Okay. In fact, so he has this idea of fluids, like electric fluids and magnetic fluids. Okay. Electric fluids are responsible for electrostatic attraction. Magnetic fluids are responsible for attracting the iron. And somehow the magnetic field only talk to iron. I don't know why he thought about that. Okay. So I want us to look at. So he is the first person we know. But nevertheless, it was actually the Orsted, the person called Orsted, who was in Copenhagen, who is the first person who experimentally demonstrated that there is a relationship between electricity and magnetism. What he did is very simple. He took a needle, the compass, and he put it in a current carrying wall. Immediately, the compass started showing deflection. You all know the compass showed deflection due to arts magnetism, but he has shown that there is a deflection of compass for a current carrying wall. Immediately, his aim was to propose that there is an intriguing relationship between electricity and magnetic phenomena. So if you look at the, the uh, document, there are a lot of write-up on this. So it seems that Orsted made a very interesting gentleman called Jonathan Wilhelm Ritter. Okay, this guy is a self-made physicist. Okay, so he is to believe that everything has opposite polarities. So there's a story that when he learned, this Ritter guy, when he learned that there is something called infrared radiation, he wanted to look for if there is something called cold rays, okay? 
So Ritter is also first guy who conjectured that there is a relationship between electricity and magnetism, but his theories were very weird, okay? Because he always believed that everything like opposites exist, okay? In fact, he is the guy who shows if there are electric poles, Earth should have also um, electric poles, like magnetic poles, okay? But immediately after Orsted, it was actually Ampere who first attempted a mathematical theory of electromagnetism. And if you open any electromagnetic book, you will see it's first the Ampere's law, okay? So he's the guy who introduced that you will be, will be able to understand this relationship between mathematics of electricity and magnetism through some kind of mathematical laws. Well, after Orsted and Ampere, it came to another outsider of physics, quote unquote, the great experimentalist Faraday to first shown conclusively experimentally the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction. And he clearly proved the relationship between electricity and magnetism and led to the beginning of the science of electrodynamics. So it took like, uh, in some sense, some 1600 to 1800, 200 years, humanity to, you know, understand the modern concept of electricity prior to Einstein. And then came this person. His name is James Clark Maxwell. He's a very interesting person. He has been a, uh, uh, he was been very friend to Faraday actually. Faraday was far uh, senior to Maxwell, but they were good friends. They even have uh, personal uh, connections to letters and everything. They used to meet with each other. So Maxwell's in 1860 published a famous paper and this paper successfully proved a mathematical theory which connects electric and magnetic phenomena. In fact, he gave a series of equations. Okay, I mean, if you look at this original, paper is like, like large number of equations, very difficult notation, which we don't use those notations today. He gave like series of several equations. I actually counted some 20 equations. I have to understand why he using that word because I mean, there is not much equation because his notations were different than us. But these equations determine the electric and magnetic field from charges and currents. So if I give you charges and current, if you could able to solve this equation, you will give get the magnetic and electric field. Okay. By the way, the modern form of Maxwell's equation are actually due to a guy called Heaviside. I'll talk to him, come to Heaviside. Heaviside is a very important role to play while talking about electromagnetic, the Lorentz transformation. Okay. So if you actually look, uh, uh, go to any good library, you will find this book. Okay. It's called uh, Tracy's on Electricity and Magnetism. It's a book written by Maxwell. Anybody who is interested in understanding the history of electromagnetism prior to relativity theory, I sincerely suggest look at this book, okay? This book is very difficult to read. I've been trying to read this book, particularly the part where he derived what is called a displacement current, but it's actually remarkable. So if you, there's a very interesting quotation I found from Orsted, okay? And so this is the quotation, sorry, from Heaviside. So Heaviside is a guy who started to read the try to read that book. And he immediately had a, exactly the same reaction which I also had that it's a very, very difficult book, okay? It's the mathematical analysis is very, very, you know, I, what should I say is it's, it's just too long, too difficult, okay? But then Heaviside, what he did, he tried to derive this equation by his own notation. And this is the beginning of the modern notation of vector analysis, okay? So we should uh, thankful to Heaviside that today we can write down Maxwell's equation in four lines, okay? And that credit goes to this Mr. Heaviside, okay? So what Maxwell's equation predicted is a remarkable result, okay? First of all, I'm not, of course, going into the details of the Maxwell's equation and something like that. What it predicted is that the existence of the electromagnetic waves. If you solve those equations, that equations tells you there must exist wave which is the undulation of electric and magnetic field propagating in space, okay? It's unmistakable prediction, okay? What is interesting is that Maxwell's equation also predicted the speed of these waves. And it turns out there's a one and only speed. The equations are very clear, okay? And that speed of these waves is 10 to the per eight meter per second. Okay. I mean, uh, you should look at the original Maxwell's paper. I have looked at it and it's just, it gives so much joy. So he's using the language we exactly use in the class. Okay, it's not much of a different where he's talking about that the speed of this wave is exactly same as the speed of light. Okay. 
What is interesting is that I also learned that there are two gentlemen, Weber and Korash, I cannot uh, pronounce this word name correctly. Okay. So these two experimentalists are also, you know, there is this ratio one by mu zero epsilon zero, which is at those times is called the ratio of absolute electromagnetic unit of charge to the absolute electrostatic unit of charge, whatever that means. But the idea is that it is the same ratio which is related to the, the speed of propagation of electromagnetic wave. So these two guys calculated that, uh, experimentally measured that ratio. They also found this value approximately equal to 10 to the power eight meter per second square. But in, uh, they didn't make any connection. They simply didn't recognize that this is the speed of light, but Maxwell's did, okay. So uh, this is a very interesting book, the story of electric and magnetic measurement by Joseph Kethley. And I suggest you can look at this book, which has very nice uh, uh, history of this measurement in the electromagnetic theory. So Maxwell's equation clearly established the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And not only that, it gives you a remarkable prediction that electromagnetic disturbance travel at the speed of light. And the conclusion is that the light we see is actually an electromagnetic wave. Later, Hertz did remarkable experiments, which actually proved that this is indeed the case, but it's okay. The existence of the electromagnetic waves are proven, but this is what it is. Okay. Great. Now, once light is understood to be an electromagnetic wave, and then it led to a revolution in science. Look, light being a wave is, was not a new concept. Even during the Newton's time, Newton used to believe that light is a set of corpuscles. Okay, the, you know, some particles which has different different energies for different different colors okay in some sense it's very interesting that it's almost close to what we do it for photon but of course completely radically different idea but it was young's double slit experiment and also in 1801 and also several experiments related to the interference and diffraction clearly showed that corpuscular theory is not enough to explain the nature of the light it was clear that we need waves because the waves, it is easy to describe diffraction, particular interference or diffraction is almost trivial to explain through waves. And we also know other waves in nature, for example, sound waves or elastic waves through matter, these are well known. But the sound waves are longitudinal. What it means is that when sound wave moves, the displacement of the particles of the medium is along the direction of the wave. So the wave moves in some X direction, the medium also undulate in the X direction, okay? But it is clear even in the 17th century that this cannot be true for light. In fact, this is one of the reasons if you look at Newton's optics, okay, I, so it's, it's very difficult to read these books. So I looked at few lines. The one of the motivation for Newton to consider the corpuscular theory of light is a phenomenon called double refraction. So double refraction is basically, you can actually see in this picture, a double refraction, it's a calcite crystal, okay. So if the light goes through it, it seems the light is divided into two parts. One is called ordinary ray, other is called extraordinary ray. So what people have found that it is possible to change the orientation of this signal, uh, this crystal and block the passage of ray, light through it. And this led to the discovery of polarization of light. Once the polarization of light is discovered, it is clear these undulations are not happening Act along the direction of the motion. Otherwise, we will not be able to block the light by just rotating orientation. And therefore, light cannot be longitudinal waves. This was clear even at the beginning days. Okay, And therefore, the, this must be what they call the transverse wave. What is interesting, how Newton reacted to so. So Newton tried to explain this polarization by assuming that light particles are asymmetrical. They have different axes. And when as a, most of the axis of orientation matches with the axis of these crystals, they allow it to propagate. Okay, it's a very bizarre uh, explanation, but again, it's interesting to read. But this immediately led to a puzzle. It was even clear at that time, okay, light is a transverse wave, but we hardly know transverse waves in nature. Because the transverse wave, when it traveled to elastic medium, we can create transverse wave in elastic medium. This was known to engineers particularly the shear waves, for example. But the problem is it's very difficult to make them a propagate. In fact, there is a personal communication between Fresnel and Poiso. Poiso is the same guy of the Poiso statistics who was also a person who worked on elastic mediums in light propagation in, 
uh, sorry, the propagation of elastic waves. So it was Poirot who first uh, wrote to Fresnel that what are you talking about? Light is a transverse wave. If light is a transverse wave, how it is possible that light has a propagating through distances after distances? What is the point? Okay, well, how will you even understand that in elastic medium light can propagate if it is a transverse wave? It is quite interesting to read the reply by friends. And the reply is like this, look, experiments suggest it is a transverse wave, accept it. And from that deduce the nature of the medium. It's like exactly what, you know, in 20th century, a modern physicist who said, start off and calculate. The experimenter suggested build you, build your model around experiments, okay? So therefore there are many, many phenomena which compelled us to accept that light is a transverse wave. But obviously the question was, what was the medium? In fact, it is clearly the Poiseau, I am looking at this personal communication between Poiseau and Fresnel, where Poiseau is asking question, how it is even possible that a transverse wave traveled through elastic medium? Because see, at those times, please understand the basic notion of science was very, very mechanistic, okay? So there's this idea of this mechanical view of the universe, which is, you know, dom dominated by these philosophical ideas of Laplace, that there's a deterministic mechanical view. And therefore everything needs to be described in mechanical terms, like torques, elasticity, okay, the matter, energies. These were the, you know, key terms, okay. So therefore they also wanted to explain the propagation of light in terms of like propagation of wave in elastic media. And obviously it turns out it's very difficult. So therefore they conjectured the existence of a completely new object. Okay, I mean, it's a quasi religious object I would call, it's called the ether, okay. And what is this ether? So the word ether, I was looking at the origin of the word ether, it's actually quite interesting. So in Greek mythology, ether is actually personification of the bright upper sky. Okay. If you look, look at Plato, Plato mentioned that the cosmic spheres are filled with a fifth element, which he called quintessence or the ether. Okay. So there is some, you know, beyond four elements, there is something, the fifth one, which they always called ether. Okay. So he's son of darkness and the brother of day or something. And his uh, offspring of time and the brother of chaos, of course, the ether brought a lot of chaos. In fact, there is a very nice uh, sculpture in Berlin Museum of ancient Greece sculptures. I don't know where they have found it. I have not looked at it. So it is supposedly the ether fighting with a giant, okay, which has a lion head. And there's this, I found there's a third century Orphic, which is the Greek philosophical poems. And you can look at these poems uh, where they talks about the cosmic element, radius, lumifers, and it's, it's quite interesting that uh, it's not very different than what physicists in 18th century or 19th century wanted the ether to be, okay? So this is the, the there's this word ether came from this idea. There is a bizarre element, which is completely beyond our understanding. So what does the nature, what the experiments with light demands about the nature of ether? So the experiment demand that ether has to be fluid it, because it also fill the entire universe. So it is there from everywhere, okay, from here to moon, to the stars, to the skies and everywhere. And you can think of we are living inside ether, okay. It has to be very rigid in order to support the very high frequency propagation of light waves. But also it has to have a very low viscosity because otherwise the planets would have detected this motion because it was already clear at that time, planetary motion can be understood by free motion under gravity. You don't need any viscosity to explain planetary motion. So it is clear that it has to have also a very small viscosity. So of course it's transparent, we don't see it, non-dispersive, incompressible, and you know even continuous to a very small case. So in 1908, Lord Raleigh, okay, so there's a typical British joke in one of the uh, lectures. He said that it has been said, someone sarcastically, that ether was made in England. The statement is only an exaggeration of the truth. I might even urge that it is largely constructed in the Royal Institution. Okay. I don't know, it's a typical British joke. Okay. But even this, I mean, it's very difficult to understand what is this ether, but it was considered seriously. Okay, It's not that, um, it was not considered seriously as always. So if you look, so uh, if you want to know what was the contemporary ideas of ether, 
There is an encyclopedia article which Maxwell himself wrote in 1878. It's a very, very interesting article. It's available online. In fact, there he says that ethers were invented for planets to swim in, to constitute electric atmosphere and magnetic effluvia, to convey sensation of one part of our bodies to another and so on and so forth. And then what he concludes is that the only ether which has survived is that which was invented by Huygens to explain the propagation of light. So Huygens was also one of the person who was talking about this ether theories, okay? Obviously he was one of the guys who worked on light. So the question is, of course, you conjecture this medium has to exist, but how do you know it exists? So the onus is now on the experimentalist. So experimentalists took up the challenge. The, okay, you are talking about this ether medium. Let us try to detect the ether, okay? So this is the story, more or less the development of electrodynamics, okay? That it compelled us to believe that light is a transverse wave. But once light is a transverse wave, we have to believe that there must exist a new medium, which is called the ether with respect to which light is propagating. Now I'll shift to a parallel story, which is also, you know, uh, uh, you know, developing parallel to this development of the electrodynamics. And this is started with, of course, I'm not going to the, say my, I'm not very concentrating too much on mechanics here for obvious reason, because I believe Einstein's main motivation was electrodynamics. Okay, so electrodynamics of moving bodies. Okay? So I will not go into deeply into what is the idea of this Galilean idea, how it came to be from ancient time. Okay? There was rich history of mechanical mechanics. Okay? But at least what we know in 17th century, it was more or less summarized in this famous book by Galileo, where it's a dialogue between the two opposite systems of life uh, world where Galileo is the guy represented by Salviati and there's another guy, Salviado, we were talking, in fact, arguing with each, each other between the Galilean view of world and the old Aristotelian view of world, okay? And they're fighting with each other, not fighting, sorry. I mean, they're much better than the modern TV debates, but anyway. So in that book, there is this idea, how do you know that art is rotating? So this idea of art is rotating, should I not be able to detect it? Of course, today you know how to detect it by Coriolis first, but the, the whole idea came to a philosophical question. Can I detect the state of motion? And then can I detect the state of uniform motion? Then Galileo gave this famous example, no, you cannot. There's this thought experiment that Galileo discussed, it's called Galileo's ship in that particular book. Of course, that book never mentioned Galileo, it mentioned the word salviati, okay? So the idea is very simple. The idea is that if you are at rest and if you are in uniform motion, let's say inside a car, okay, but uniform motion and all the you know, windows are darkened, okay? You will never be able to distinguish from rest with uniform motion. Not that. How do you know you were inside a car when the car you know, applies brake? That means the velocity changes or it speeds up, accelerates. So idea is that as long as the car accelerates, you will never be, or decelerates, you will never be able to understand whether you are in a static car or a car moving in a uniform motion, okay? Now it seems to you a very you know, trivial conclusion, but it turns out to be a very, very deep principle. So let's understand why it is deep principle. Suppose you are Galileo and you are measuring the velocity and here you have a you know, Lamborghini, okay? And there's Lamborghini moving with a velocity u. So you measure the velocity u. And there is this poor guy who is uh, traveling as always with ambassador, okay? He made that the ambassador itself is moving with a velocity v. Of course, the v is less than u because it's the ambassador. So ambassador also measured the velocity of the Lamborghini and he will find you know, in class two, three, we learned this uh, velocity addition rule, u minus v, okay? And depending on which distances you are, which directions you are moving or whatnot. What is interesting is that the laws of Newton will give the same result in both frames. So basically you can do calculations inside Ambassador, Lamborghini or Galileo, as long as they are moving with each other only in uniform velocity, you will never be able to distinguish these guys, okay? So basically the state of absolute rest cannot be distinguished by the state of uniform motion. This is the idea of principle of relativity, okay? I can't say all motion is relative. To be honest, all uniform motion is relative, at least this idea what it suggests. So this is true. It is true that Newton's law are consistent with this principle of relativity. The mathematics of Newton's law seems to be 
obey the principle of relativity okay but there is life and light beyond newton okay the obvious question if you are a modern physicist you would have asked that whether the electromagnetic phenomena um, obeys we learned that electromagnetic phenomena obeys maxwell's equation so if you are a modern physicist you will immediately ask that whether the maxwell's equations are invariant under lamborghini to ambassador transformation okay well if you think of it okay uh, it is already at the beginning you will see there is a roadblock and why there is a roadblock why because maxwell's equation predicted a speed of light which is exactly 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second is unambiguous prediction okay it came in terms of the fundamental constant related to electromagnetic phenomena then obviously you should ask that with respect to what frame is it with respect to ambassador or is it with respect to lamborghini the speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second so it is obvious that it if the velocity addition rules which we have learned in our classical mechanics or in the you know primary schools if they are valid then it cannot happen that the speed of light is always 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second it would depend who is measuring the speed of light what is the state of motion of the measuring apparatus so therefore it is obviously clear that maxwell's equation cannot be true same due to the very velocity addition rule and there must be a very preferred frame with respect to which the velocity of light is exactly 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second for other frame we need modification and this modification will change the speed of light depending on the who is measuring it's almost like obvious but in history of science there is this very very interesting person name i figure found which is oldemar weight okay is a very interesting person he was a german physicist okay he was in the uh, university of gottingen okay and uh, it's very interesting he was the head of the mathematical physics department after him it was you know Uh, I think Debye K become his head, and then the Max Born. There's this great tradition of mathematical physics at this University of Gottingen. So it's it's a, he's a very interesting person. Okay, so he was looking at what is called the Doppler effect. In fact, his paper is called on the theory of Doppler effect. Okay, so he asked a very very interesting question. By the way, he was also a crystallographer. This is his picture. Okay, he does look like little bit of Voldemort of Um, that Harry Potter series, but anyway, so it seems he has done pioneering work on piezoelectricity. He was like a crazy collector of crystals, and whatever he used to get crystals, he used to make the measurement of the electrical properties of those crystals. Okay, I don't know why, but I'm sure there was good reason. Okay, so he was studying Doppler effect of light. Remember that light velocities were known even in 1600 due to the Romer the measurement of velocity of light using the uh, Jupiter moons. Okay. so he was asking a very simple question he was asking i want to derive the doppler formulas for light how the frequency is changing when it is measured from the uh, moving frame so he asked okay i want to know so suppose i have a light wave front a solution of the wave equations which maxwell has given what is the transformation which will leave the wave front shape invariant a plane wave front even plane wave front so that i will be able to look at the transformation equation and then relate omega and omega prime in both the transform quantity that was his motivation so in modern notation if you are a modern physicist what you are looking at is you are checking the covariance of the homogeneous wave equation of course he didn't wrote down in this notation what he immediately found that if you wrote down the wave equation okay the solutions of wave equation is x minus ct kind of form immediately he realized that to keep the wave front the shape of the wave front unchanged you not only have to do a transformation of the space but you also have to do of the transformation of the time in fact there is a famous line in his paper it seems that top derivation of the doppler effect is not as consistent with the newton's idea of universal time so if you look at this gula i have so it is basically in modern notation it is t prime equal to t minus vx y c square okay that's what it is but in his notation is some cumbersome some ideas okay so this is the first glimpse of the relativistic transformation okay this paper is extremely important in the history of science he is the first person who found set of transformation which keeps the solution of the homogeneous wave equation same by the way this is not same as lorentz transformation i leave it as a homework to test how they are related to a uh, lorentz transformation this okay good 
So the Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is in conflict with the Galilean principle of relativity. It is obviously clear even to the you know, people like Maxwell as well as people like anybody like Voigt Boy, and other guys. Okay. So the question is that, okay, would I be able to detect okay, uh, uh, this absolute frame, the so-called ether by measuring the speed of light with respect to it? So the idea is that measure the speed of light with respect to ether and look at whether from which you can detect the exist infer the existence of the ether. Okay. So for example, if you are moving towards the ether and away from the ether, okay, suppose uh, there will be a detectable change in the speed of light and that will give you a handle to measure the presence of the ether. First such experiment done by a amazing, another amazing person, Fidzau, who was an, actually an engineer, okay? And is a French engineer who was very well known at his time. By the way, if you go to uh, uh, this so-called the French, this uh, tower, what is this called? The Alpha Tower, okay? Eiffel Tower, it's supposedly there are 72 great engineers name was inscribed in the Alpha Tower who contributed in the creation and the design of this tower. So Fidzau was one of them. What is also interesting, he was the only surviving member of the 72 engineers when Alpha Tower or Eiffel Tower was ultimately opened. Okay. All the 71 guys died before it. Okay. Anyway, so that's another fact to know. So what he did is a very simple experiment. He wanted to know, suppose I have a flowing water as in the picture, the water is flowing in this direction of this arrow. And I measured the speed of light at, when light is traveling along the water and this light is traveling opposite the direction of the water. Okay. Should I see a difference in the speed of light? So if you believe that light is dragged by the water, just like ether will drag the light, then you should have used these formulas and that will give you a difference in the velocity. But amazingly, the, interestingly, what the, he found by doing experiment that instead of this C by V plus V, he got X, factor, which is one minus one by n square, where n is nothing but the refractive index of the light. So if you put vacuum, you see what is happening. Okay. You see that in vacuum, his formulas are consistent with V equal to C. So it seems there is no ether drag. So this one minus one by n square factor is extremely important. It is called the Fresnel drag coefficient. It seems that Fresnel derived this drag coefficient using some ether model. Okay of the disturbances of light and whatever. Okay, so, but the conclusion was very simple that somehow when I replace water by ether, okay, which means the pure vacuum, I don't see any ether drag. Okay. So that's what they call the partial drag model. Okay, this is very strange. But what is interesting is that the next surprise was far more, you know, outstanding, okay. And that surprise came from the other side of the Atlantic. Note that, and it is quite interesting that most of the characters which I am mentioning, they're all European names, okay? Mostly French and German, but also other people, okay? Uh, like, but the guys who did the fundamental experiment, this actually came from US, the Michelson Morley and Michelson and Morley. In fact, Michelson was the first American who got the Nobel Prize in physics for the invention of what we call now the inter Michelson interferometer, which is a very, very sensitive instrument to measure the wavelength of light, okay? So Michelson and Morley immediately understood that they can use interferometry to further develop this measurement, okay? And I am not going to those details. If you look at the previous uh, experiment, it was what is called the first order experiment at that time. So sensitive to the V by C. So Michelson and Morley wanted to go to the second order, the V by C square, okay? Let's not go for it. These are technicalities, okay? Basically what they wanted to know is that, okay, arch is moving through the ether. So if I can measure the speed of light across the direction of the earth and perpendicular to it, I'll be able to get a difference. And that difference I can attribute with the existence of the ether, okay? Because I'm measuring with respect to ether and across to it. And the difference will be the conclusive proof that the ether exists. So this is the original picture of the instrument which these guys use. So what they do there, they'll measure the interference fringes, light beams traveling onto each other, and then it'll rotate the instrument by 90 degree so that they become perpendicular to the earth motion. 
and then again look at the fringes and their expectation is that since the speed of light is different due to the presence of ether i should see a difference in the fringe pattern okay so it turns out none so there is a letter michelson sent in to lord raleigh in 1887 so it's i found it in the wiki commons uh, with here yeah. so the letter you can look at it is very interesting so the way an experimentalist would have write to uh, somebody like a lord raleigh which is a properly a theorist that experiments on the relative motion of earth and ether have been completed and the result decidedly negative the expected deviation of the interference it fringes from zero should have been 0.04 of a fringe that was is expected if you calculate the using the arm length and whatever is known at that time then the speed of light and every with respect to ether then in their language they should have expected 0.4 of width of a fringe to change when they rotate the instrument by 90 degree but it turns out the maximum displacement is 0.02 which is basically an instrumental error okay and the average is actually much less than that and also they are in all kind of different place i don't know what he exactly mean when he said not in the right place as displacement is proportional to a square of the relative velocities it follows that the ether does slip past the relative velocity less than the 1/6 of the earth's velocity so basically you cannot detect the existence of the ether so this is probably the most famous failed experiment ever all the experiment done so far starting with the fitzhaus experiment where they wanted to know whether the ether drags the light and also the stationary ether experiment where they wanted to know if i move out across the ether can i see the change of the velocity along the direction of the motion and the perpendicular to it all this experiment failed okay so therefore now the onus the core ball is back to the court of the theorist the theorist told the experimentalist look you should go and detect this ether experimentalist tried their best and they they could not and they are now started telling the theorist the onus is on you describe and explain what is going on the null result of the michelson mold experiment led to enormous scientific activity even i mean you know uh, so i was thinking when i was preparing this slide there was a, some little bump in the lhc data and the thousands of papers will arrive okay so we say that look what is the status of the science nowadays but to be honest it was not very difficult okay not very different even at that time there was no archive there was not much people but again there are thousands of model people started writing models okay to explain the michelson mold in all result of the michelson mold experiment uh, it is i mean of course i should be careful because there are people like poncare and lorenz involved in this modeling but there were other people also and this was very bad model in some sense okay in i mean at two days only in retrospective of course that is also true so the idea was immediately people understood that if somehow the arms of the interferometer the length of the arms if they are contracted along the direction of the motion then we should be able to explain the uh, null result of the michelson mold experiment okay i'm not going to detail so take it as a I mean, you have to believe me that that is obvious if you look at the derivation so therefore there are two extraordinary people who started giving very extraordinary intriguing ideas these two guys were one is a great mathematician henry poncare and other is a great theoretical physicist Lawrence, okay, and during the interval of 1990, remember the Wilkinson or Mold experiment is 1887. These guys started giving their theories in 1890, and it went up to 1905. Actually, up to 1908, I have seen Poncare paper in 1908 talking about ether. That means still it is not digested to the scientific community. The Einstein's paper, okay. The idea of this box were very simple. Can you design a theory of matter? so this is very important the theory of matter charges and electrons which lead to the lower contraction of the motion contraction of the length towards the direction of the motion so they were trying to say can i develop a theory of matter which predict when the body moves the its length contract and what was their motivation why they think it's very interesting the result came by 1888 derivation by heaviside i told you this character heaviside the person who actually gave us the maxwell's equation in our you know uh, language and our notation 
he derived the electric field due to a charge body moving with uniform velocity this is a classic derivation we even do it nowadays in our btech classes okay while teaching the btech classes and we do it using the einstein relativity this is actually the thing you should do okay but those days they were actually they have uh, maxwell's equation they actually integrated the maxwell's equation and figured it out the electric field due to this motion of the charge particle even today many books discuss this derivation and if you look at this derivation if you know a little bit of special relativity hello i have already sent it to party so varat varat party okay sorry so if you look at this derivations you will see there is a very interesting 1 minus v square by c square uh, factor in the numerator so heavy side concluded if you look at the electric field along the theta equal to pi by 2 that means moving perpendicular and theta equal to zero that is moving across the motion of the particle then there is a factor this v by c square whole to the power 3 by 2 that factor comes okay you can clearly see from here so this result led to an interesting letter in the journal science by a guy called fitzgerald he was also thinking along with he was, they were all friends with lorentz okay so he wrote down this result and he immediately looked at this heavy side derivative and said hey it could well be possible that this electric field of the charge particle self react on the particle itself because there is a asymmetry in the electric field there will be asymmetry in this self reaction and that would lead to the compression of the matter in fact the i'll quote from that paper their result so look at it the last few lines we know that the electric forces are affected by the motion of the electrified bodies relative to the ether and i uh, bold this uh, look at the bold fed it seems a not probable super supposition that the molecular forces are affected by the motion and the size of the body alters consequently so the idea is that there are molecular forces which would be similar to electromagnetic force this is also a big assumption and therefore whenever the body moves these molecular forces will also have this asymmetry and that will back react on the body and make the leth contract this is the beginning of what is called the lorentz theory of electrons okay and there is a large number of papers came not only from lorentz by abraham by uh, there is a guy called lamour and there is also i mean many people poncare of course okay justifying lorentz contraction from the theory of matter so this is the derivation we readily do in the class and today we know why it has to be the actual reason is quite simple but they had of course no idea of that actual reason this is the path which lorentz and poncare followed okay lorentz also understood that this uh, factor okay can immediately be understood if there is a transformation equation which relates and led to the invariance of the maxwell equation okay so he wrote down those transformation equation and he called them the relate the, the transformation equations which keeps the motion in uh, electromagnetic motion invariant okay Lorentz tried to develop the theory of electrons and attempt to derive the electrons was already known at that time okay so it was known that a charge object inside the matter what lorentz was trying to see is that when the matter moves there is a field of this charge objects and that should self react with the matter create this uh, so called uh, uh, contraction okay so they were all doing self force calculation okay and they're not easy to do okay what is interesting is that at the same time zeeman found a intriguing effect which is called the zeeman effect what he has shown that if you look at the sodium lines okay if you put them into a magnetic field the sodium lines are broadened today we call this anomalous zeeman effect i'm not going to those details okay spin dependent spin non dependent ignore that but the basic idea is that the spectral lines are affected by magnetic forces and for lorentz is a telltale sign that his theory is correct because light consists of anything which is light is consist of electromagnetic electron motion and therefore whenever you put it into a magnetic field they will be affected and in fact this is the place where he derived what is called nowadays the famous lorentz force law and it's clear if you think of electron in a uh, magnetic field uh, you can clearly see that some of the electron will go this way some of the electron will that way and the, for lorentz that is responsible for the broadening of the spectral line of the sodium okay what he called a d1 d2 lines okay remarkably this is given this 
remarkable idea was awarded Nobel Prize. So Lorenz and Zeman was given Nobel Prize in 1992. Zeman could not able to attend that Nobel Prize ceremony because of some illness. So I suggest look at the Nobel Prize lecture by Lorenz in 1992. You will be able to understand how physicists are thinking just before the appearance of the guy, just before the appearance of Einstein. So everything, whatever the ideas of electron and the ether was there, it's summarized in that Nobel Prize lecture. It's remarkable, actually. At the same time, it was Poincare, so I should a little bit hurry. I'm almost running out of my time. So Poincare was beginning to ponder about the nature of relativity principle and ether. So Poincare, of course, was the leading mathematicians at that time. Okay, I was like, you know, three body problem to algebraic topology, his contribution is phenomenal, okay? He is definitely the person who first proposed the principle of relativity as a physics principle beyond mechanics. And I've seen those papers he's actually talking about the, there has to be an invariance principle on all physics and all phenomena. Of course, he only mentioned mechanics and electromagnetism, but those were the phenomena only known and you should look at his exact thing, okay? This postulate, which up till only agrees with experiment must be confirmed and or disproved by later more precise experiment. Okay, so in fact, he says, it is in all case interest to see what consequences can flow from it. This is a paper in June, 1905, two months before the publications of Einstein's paper. Nevertheless, he also attempt, attempted to find an electromagnetic theory of matter. Note that where they have almost closed, they have understood that there is a principle of invariance of the Maxwell's equation. Speed of light should not change. They are, that is also a natural explanation of the michelson moldy experiment. It was clear in Poincare's paper, but at the same time, they were always going back to the theory of matter. They were saying, okay, all these things, can I derive it from the theory of matter? Interestingly, J.J. Uh, Thomson noticed that the electromagnetic energy contribute to the mass of the charged particle by this amount. If any of done, people have done the self-force calculation from a standard textbook like Griffith knows this relationship, okay? This is called the mass renormalization of the, from the electromagnetic. So look at this fourth third formula. So the idea at that time was all mass came from electromagnetic uh, energy. But then fourth third created a problem. It seems it is more than what you need. You need one. Mass should be exactly same as EM by C square. So for that, Poincare created a very interesting thing. He created a minus contribution, which he called the Poincare tress. It's some non-electrical object. I mean, it's some hitherto unknown pressure, which will make this contribution exactly equal to M by E C square, okay? Exactly entirely mass will come from entirely due to the electromagnetic energy. Mass is equal to the electromagnetic energy divided by C squared. That's the conversion, okay? So look at his approach that he was almost there, but again, he's looking from a wrong window. He's looking from, you know, the theory of matter where you should have looked at the theory of simple measurement, okay? What is also interesting, we know that electromagnetic energy has this factor one minus V square by C square because obviously it has to have. So immediately they also predicted the mass should change in velocity. Both Lorentz Poincare predicted that mass should change in velocity from this argument. This is a complete long argument that the conclusion is absolutely correct. In fact, they wrote down models, depending on how this matter is, they wrote down models, something called the Lorentz model, something called the Abraham model, okay. And those models, Give us, if you plot, so I just plotted there's different models, how the mass should change with velocity. It turns out the special relativity agrees with the Lorentz model, which is this formula. So all these notions were told to them. They were actually predicted that we should see that mass change with velocity. That is because for them, mass is contributed by electromagnetic energy. That has this one minus V square by C square factor. So this is the status of the history beyond which a new guy come. And this is where the 1905 Anna is. Don't worry, I'm about to end the talk. So Albert Einstein was a clerk in a Swiss patent office. And I was reading the autobiographical notes by Einstein in 1951. Remember, Einstein died in 54, I think, where he wrote that a paradox he had at the age of 60. By the way, I don't know, you know, I don't know whether Einstein is honest enough in saying that, but let's assume he was, of course, it was Einstein, okay? So 
look at his approach and how different it was from the Poincaré approach. He didn't care about electrons, matter, okay. He asked, how do I see light when I'm traveling at the speed of light? So the intuitive idea that the rad, his approach was so radically different. He was not interested in deriving anything about matter. His starting point was recognize and accept the principle of relativity as a meta principle of physics. So he assumed that the principle of relativity has to be the principle all physics should obey. And then he added another one line of physics, the constancy of speed of light in that moment. He didn't bother to drive looking at the Maxwell's equation. Probably he was not as good as mathematics in Poincaré. So I saw a quotation by somebody in internet, if Poincaré would have derived relativity, if you're a little bit dumb, okay. Okay, don't take that quotation seriously. And then there is this famous line in the paper. Okay, so I suggest you look at it. I will only look that these two postulates suffice the last line to attainment of a simple and consistent theory of electrodynamics of moving bodies based on Maxwell's theory of stationary bodies. Special relativity solves all the problems we know and is a remarkable way. It provides a simple explanation of all the experimental results of the new ones. Okay, The idea of absolute time is completely discarded. Notion of simultaneity becomes observer independent. And the length contraction and time dilation arise as a natural consequence of the measurement process, nothing to do with theory of matter. In fact, the same mass velocity relationship was also there in special relativity, but the interpretation was totally different. Okay. How, what was the reaction by Lawrence, Lawrence and Poincaré? Very interesting. So if you look at Lawrence, he immediately understood that this is a revolution. So he gave a series of lectures in Columbia University on the theory of relativity. Please note, look at these lectures if you're interested. And it is clear that he immediately understood the difference between Einstein's theory and his theory. He says that I was looking at the theory of matter, but for Einstein, it was the invariance principle and the non-existence of the absolute time, which is the key, the simultaneity or relativity of simultaneity. Whereas I was most interested in the matter part. Okay, so there was, I was in a wrong door. But at the same time, he also mentioned the controversy, the, uh, uh, you know, the contribution by Poincaré, okay? There's no doubt Poincaré is the person who understood uh, Lorentz transformation. In fact, Poincaré also understood Lorentz transformation forms a group. The Lorentz group was discovered by Poincaré and later generalized to Poincaré group. Poincaré also understood that velocity of light constant should have natural consequences, but as always, he was not keen enough to make the next step. He was too boggled down to the mathematical details of matter. In fact, even in 1908, he was talking about ether. So there's a very interesting lecture about Poincaré in French Science Association, where you see that the bold lines, perhaps they have been too great haste to consider these novelties that definitely established to shatter our idols of yesterday. In fact, it is kind of a doubtful optimism. Also interesting in 1912, he writes the mechanics of Lorentz endures. Didn't take the name Einstein. Okay, that's strange. There's a, there's a subtle relationship between Einstein and Poincaré. Einstein also didn't mention Poincaré contribution much later. Okay. So, okay, but Poincaré died in 1912. Okay. So this is the last slide. So what do we learn from the history of special relativity? It is obvious. It's a classic example of scientific evolution. It's a paradigm shift of the understanding of the universe. It is also clear that the process of science is a gradual painstaking process. The individual plays their important role, there is no doubt, but the continuity of the effort is also crucial. Okay. It is impossible that Einstein could have come up to special relativity when out of nothing. Okay. It is both collective as well as a personal phenomenon. There is no contradiction in these lines. Okay. I mean, it's not like a mathematics. There's only one answer. This, it's, a, it's a superposition of this fact. It is difficult to answer if the scientific progress is a continuous process or discontinuous process of our view of the universe. So we cannot say the Einstein worldview is a complete departure from the previous thinking or rather a completion of the past ideas. Both can be argued. It is interesting to ask why Einstein could able to find special relativity. Obviously, Poincaré and Lorenz was no less brilliant. This is an interesting question. I conjecture that it is probably his relative isolation from the contemporary scientific world. That is my conjecture because he was not known, care, not aware of the publications already, okay? not much aware. Okay. Although there are, I found people also contested this idea. Okay. 
By the way, Einstein's original paper had no reference, zero reference. He just mentioned the word Maxwell. Okay. With that, I conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shudipto. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for again for that amazing talk. It was very interesting. Thank you.